rule. Thank everybody. Welcome on this Tuesday evening, uh, voting day in New York City. Everyone noticed? Voted. Performed my duties, and hopefully the people that I voted for are going to win. Very good. You voted too. Awesome. Good job. Our uh, our little bit that we do to try to shape the future of this uh, city, this neighborhood, and this country. We're going to learn today something interesting. We'll start in chapter 20, uh, 24. Genesis chapter 24. Excuse me. Genesis chapter 24. The verse says as follows. Vavrom zokein bobayom. Abraham was old. He came into his days. And this Chumash translates as immersed into daily life. Fran, what is your Chumash translated as us? Mine says now uh, uh, Abraham was old, well on in years. Well on in years, okay. And Vashem Beirach as Avram Bakel, and God blessed Abraham with everything. Understood? This is a simple verse. Abraham was old, and God blessed him with everything. The only question that we have on this verse is what is the meaning of the words Baba Yomim? And this Chumash is translated as immersed into daily life. And Fran said, what was it? Well on in years. Well on in years. So how would you generally, let's take the translation of well on in years. How would you, what would you call well on, well on in years? How would you translate that as? Like, what's the difference between old and well on in years? 90. In other words, there's old and there's very old, right? Old and very old. So Avram wasn't just old. Avram was very old. How old actually was Avram when this verse was written? Avram was 137 years old. Very old. Avram was an old man. He's 138. Quite old, right? So it would make sense why the verse calls Avram. Avram was old and very old. Well on in his years. There's only one problem. Before we get to the problem, we will know that there is a difference between old and very old. And we see this in the Mishnah. There's a Mishnah in Ethics of Our Fathers, Chapter 5. Actually, the last Mishnah of Ethics of Our Fathers of the Mishnayos. And it says over there, Who are you, Aymer? He would say, When you're five years old, it's time to start reading the scripture. When you're 10, it's time to start studying the Mishnah. At 13 years old, you become obligated for the mitzvahs. At 15, you should start studying Talmud. At 18, it's time for marriage. At 20, it's time to start running to pursue a livelihood. At 30, it's, 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 it's the time of full strength. At 40 years old, you reach a level of understanding. At 50 years old, you qualify to give counsel. At 60 years old, you're considered to be, you've reached old age. Ben Shivim Liseva at 70 years old, you considered to be, have lived ripe old age. Ben Shmoinim Ligvura at 80 years old, it's a sign of special strength. Ben Tishim Lasuach at 90 years old, the body is stooped over. Ben Mea at 100 years old, Kilumais of Vavar Batam in Oilam, it's as if you were deceased and you passed away from this world. Which Hasidic when there's not the time for it, but actually 100 years old is not a derogatory thing that you, as if you passed away. But it's actually a compliment. But this is not the time to explain what that means. But I do just highlight from this mission, this idea, that the mission does differentiate between 60 and 70 as the difference between old age and ripe old age. So there is a difference over here. In Jewish teachings, there's a difference between age, old age, and ripe old age. So seemingly when we read this verse, the natural way to understand it, the simple way to understand it is, the verse is saying he wasn't just old, but he was very old. How old is very old? 138. 138? That's, that's very old, right? We, we, could, we could all safely say that that's very old. Okay. Now, let's turn back for a moment, and let's go back to uh, chapter, <clears throat> chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Verse number 11. And this is from last week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayera. And over there we know the story that the angels came 
and they to visit Avram in his tent. And the angels asked him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, she Sarah is in the tent after he served them a delicious meal. And then the angels tell him that at this time next year, your wife is going to have a son. So the verse describes, if you want to understand how miraculous this is, this is the verse describes, Vavron v'sora z'kenim. Abraham and Sarah were old. Boim bayomim. They were very old. Chod aliyes l'sora o'edach kanoshim. Sarah had already stopped having a woman's cycle. And now you're here, you're going to say that Sarah is going to have a child? She was already past the childbearing age. Her body physically no longer could have a child. And here the angels come along and say she's going to be blessed with a child no later, this time next year, in a year from now. So it makes sense why verse 12 says, or Sarah had a little chuckle. Look at my body. This, <laughs> this is body can, can, can uh, give birth to, to, to a child. This is unfathomable. But what do I want to focus on over here? You notice that the verse over here calls Avram and Sarah old. Not just old, but the same exact words are used. Boim bayomim. They were very old. Or he translates here, immersed into daily life. How old was Avram and Sarah in this verse over here? Sarah was 90 and Avraham was 99 years old. So now let's understand. If the Torah already describes Avram when he was 99 years old as being not just old, but very old. So at 137, what do you think then? He was he, he became younger? Like you have to tell me again that he was very old? If you called him old when he was 99, certainly you're going to still call him old at 138. He didn't get any younger. So why does the Torah need to describe Avraham now, 38 years later, as being very old? Something doesn't make sense. Everyone understand the question? Yes? Yes. Furthermore, we find this use, this phraseology of boim bayomim, on in his days concerning King David. King David, we know, only lived to the age of 70 years old. And yet, at the age of 70, the verse calls him or refers to him and uses this terminology of boim bayomim, about David. That David wasn't just old, but he was on in his years, what we call now very old. Doesn't The Hebrew doesn't say very old. The Hebrew says boim bayomim. Which means he's on in his in his in his days. We're just assuming that that would mean very old, but we're questioning that assumption now because number one, we, if he was old at ninety nine, he certainly was very old at one thirty eight, one thirty seven. And if David was very old at seventy, well then the whole thing falls apart because you're already calling people very old, boy and by young at the age of seventy years old. So certainly it would apply to Avram at 99 and at 137. So again, why does the Torah use this? Why does the Torah feel it important to stress this not once but twice and 38 years apart? Why is this so significant? Age. And the description of life. Then let's go now to this week's parsha, the opening words of the parsha. And although the parsha is called Chaye Sarah, which is the life of Sarah, actually the Torah discusses the death of Sarah. Sarah dies in the opening verse of this week's parsha, the, the second verse on page one thirty-three. Before the Torah tells us that Sarah passes, the Torah tells us in verse number one, chapter twenty-three, verse one. Sarah's lifetime was 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years. Shnei chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, the years of Sarah. Why does the Torah say this strange way of saying that Sarah was 127 years old when she died? Sarah was 100, Sarah was 20, Sarah was 7, and these are the years of Sarah's life. 
So if you notice in the parentheses in this formish over here, it says we're all equally good. And this comes from Rashi. In this formish, anytime there's a parenthesis, it comes from Rashi. And Rashi says, why does the Torah divide it by the hundreds and tens and the single digits? To teach us that every single one of these needs its own exegesis. When she was 100, she was like 20 without any sin. If she was like 20, just like at 20 years old, she was no sin. So at 100, she was no sin. And when she was 20, she was cute like a seven-year-old. Then the Torah says, Shnei chai yisara, the life, these are the years of Sarah. Kulu and Shovin They are all equally good. All of her years were equally good. Now, this sounds beautiful to say. It's almost like when someone gets up at a funeral and says that this person was such an awesome, amazing person and such a special person, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Only saying the qualities when really everyone in the room knows, or at least some people in the room knows that this person was a miser, a terrible friend. A, a miserable person, a depressed person. What at someone's funeral? That's not what you get up and say. So, in other words, you could stretch the truth a little bit, right? You stretch the truth when it comes. It's fine. We expect it. And that's what we should be focusing on at times of death, someone's great virtues. But there's a limit to how much you can stretch. You know, someone comes and say the person never, ever, ever got upset in their whole life. I mean, Really? It seems like a little bit of an exaggeration for most people, right? The Torah is coming along and saying, Sarah, all of her years were equally good. I mean, didn't you just tell us last week and the week before how Sarah lived a very, very turbulent life? She was only kidnapped two times, once by the Pharaoh and once by Avimelech. She didn't have a child until she was 90 years old. She had to send away her stepson not once but twice because she because of issues in the home. Doesn't sound like someone who all of her years were equally good. I mean, come on, the Torah can't play games with us like that. You just give a look at a couple of chapters earlier and you see how difficult Sarah's life was. The little bit that we do know about Sarah's life, all of it is associated with problems. Until her birth, till the birth of, of Isaac. And even then, there was problems in the home. You had to send away Yishmo. So what's the Torah saying over here? All of her years were equally good. I mean, come on. You can't play games with us like that. Obviously, the Torah isn't. If the Torah says it, that means it was accurate. But we have to understand, now, how is this statement accurate? How can we say about someone who lived a life like Sarah? Such a troubled life. So many issues that she had to deal with in life. The only time she finally was able to, we'll call it, have a good time and relax a little bit was after Isaac is born, a little bit of nachas she had. And then at 37, she finds out her husband takes his only kid and is going to bring him as a sacrifice and kill him. What do you think happened to the mother? She dropped dead on the spot when she heard that. And finally, for 37 years, I have a little bit of nachas and now he's gone because my husband killed him. What are we to understand from this verse in the Chumash that all of her years were equally good? So to understand this, we have to we have to study a piece of Zohar, and the Zohar gives us the the answer to the, to both to all of these questions. And the Zohar focuses on the words that we read in chapter twenty four and verse number one. And the Zohar says. That boim by yamim doesn't mean old age or nor a ripe old age. That's not what the Torah is telling us. The Torah is not trying to tell us that Abraham was very old when he was 137 years old. What the Torah is telling us is something completely different. And that you have to translate the Hebrew words literally. Boim means coming into. Bo means to come. When you want to tell someone to come with me, you say boinai. Boiti. Give it to me. Come with me. Bayama means in the days, which means the Torah says the Zohar, which means the Torah is highlighting into, to us how Avram lived his years, how Avram lived his days. That every single day by Avram is something that he walked into and he mastered the day. He took control over the day. 
which means Avraham lived life. Avraham wasn't persuaded by life. Avraham wasn't moved by life. Avraham had control over life. Avraham dictated how his day was going to be, not just when he was in a good mood, but every single day. How did Avraham do this? How could it be that Avraham was so focused that not only was he an old man, but he still had control? See, the thing, the thing is like this. People have more control and are more aware of their surroundings when they're younger. The older people get, the less filter they have. The less they care about what other people think or say about them. They could care less. And that's why they say what they want. If you don't like it, I don't care. Let's take driving for an example. Older people can drive. It's not that an older person lost a skill. But the older you get, you become less sharp. You become less aware of all of your surroundings and your reflexes become slower. Your peripheral vision becomes less. You take less in. You're, in, you're, you're less capable of taking in such a big picture and reacting to things instantly. You become slower. So although you may still know how to do it, but a number of your abilities have been diminished with time. So age takes away a lot of our abilities to connect with the world, with the outside world. We have less filters. We care less about what people think about us, which means we're thinking less about every. With that, old age comes something interesting. And that is that people want to retire. He want to stop working. He want to stop doing things. And how am I going to spend my time now that, now that I am retired? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do the next day and the next week? I don't know. We'll see what my friends are doing. We'll see what's going on in the building association. We'll see what the, 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 the condo board is up to. I don't really have any idea how I'm going to live life. I'm just going with the flow. I worked hard. I spent all of my years leading up to be able to retire. And now that I have that ability to retire, what am I doing now? I'm letting life live me. That's the reality. I care less about what's going on around me. I'm not so in touch and in tune anymore with all of my surroundings, as I used to be. One would think when Avraham was 138 years old, when he was 99 years old, already that's old age. So if he's old at 99 years old, you would think that Avraham's life changed. The way he dealt with people changed. The way he lived every single day changed. Comes along the Torah, and Torah says when he was 99 years old, Avraham was zucking, he was old. But bo, boim bayom. Avram walked into every single day. Every day Avraham lived and mastered and controlled and he did what he needed to do. He was perfectly aware of his surroundings and he dealt with them and he tried as best as he could to elevate them and connect them with Hashem. At 99 he did that. 137, 38 years later, it's only natural for that to slowly wear off. It's 38 years later. So the Torah says he was 137 and he was still boy by young. He was still walking and entering into every day. Every single day was counted for by Avram. Every single day was meaningful by Avram. And the same thing is with Sarah. What does it mean the life of Sarah was 127 years old? That all of them were equally good. They certainly weren't all equally good. That's only talking about if you consider good and bad to be something from the external. Somebody else has control over making my day good and bad. Then you're right. Some days will be good. Some days won't be good. But if that's not what life is. Life is about what I'm producing. Life is about what I'm giving. 
Life is all about what I'm accomplishing, what I'm tackling, the jobs that I'm doing today. So the resistance that I meet is par for the course. So even when there's tough resistance, as Sarah had some tough resistance in her life, to put it mildly, they, all of her days were equally good from her perspective because she was living life to its fullest. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm trying to fulfill my mission in this world. It wasn't one day, one week, one month. It was every day of her life. They were all equally good from this perspective. So how did they do this? How did Avram and Sarah do this? The answer is because they live with purpose. And if you live with purpose, so what day of your life doesn't have purpose? Tell me. If you're connected with Hashem, if you believe that God put you here and down in this world for a purpose, so what day of your life is that purpose not there? Is there ever a day where God said, now I give you life purposeless, void and lacking a mission? I woke up this morning and I got a memo that God said, now you can retire. I don't need you to do anything for me anymore. If you believe in God, if you believe you're connected to God, if you believe in life coming from Hashem, which Avram discovered, and Avram knew to be the ultimate truth that he tried to share with everybody. So every day of his life, there was not one day of his life where Avram didn't live a most purposeful life, a mission-centered life. He was focused. He woke up in the morning and he got to work. He woke up in the morning and he did what he needed to do. And he said, what does Hashem want from me today? And that's how every single day of his life, he was considered to be boim by yaman. He entered into the day. He made it a special day. He made it a, a, a day of accomplishment. And this is something that we all have to learn from Avram and Sar. King David at 70 years old did the same thing. Because when it comes to this, age is not on the passport. The Torah is not giving a description for how old you are. The Torah is just giving a description for how you live life. Boy and Bayam can be at 15, at 18, at 30, at 70, or at 170. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. Boy and Bayam. Do you walk into the day? Or do you get swept into the day? How does it work for you? Does life blow you in different directions depending on how strong the wind is? Depending on what somebody else says, that's the way? Or do you have a purpose? You wake up with a mission. Do you know that you have to do something today? Avram and Sarah teach us how we can best go about living our life. It's interesting because the Rebbe wrote a book. The Rebbe published, I should say. He wrote published a book. The first book that the Rebbe published ever is a book of daily teachings. He likes little snippets, two or three lines, sometimes five or six lines of what the previous Rebbe said at one point or another, or sometimes it's just uh, giving us a, a custom, a Chabad custom, what to do. What did the Rebbe name his book? His first book that he published with a teaching, a small, short teaching for the day. He called his book Hayom Yom. The word yom in Hebrew is day. Hayom yom means the day is a day. And people would say, why did the Rebbe call his book Hayom yom? The first book that he published, Hayom yom. Because the Rebbe was saying, and in, in just in the name of the book, Hayom, the day, yom was a day. You know, when you did something good, what do you say? Ah, today I accomplished something. Today was a meaningful day. If you didn't accomplish anything, you look back on it and you say, what a waste of time. I really wasted a lot of time today. So the Rebbe was teaching us Hayom Yom. Every day has to be a day. Every day has to be accounted for. Hasidim would say, the way you wake up in the morning is the way you go to sleep at night. 
you can't go to sleep like a horse and expect to wake up like a person. That's the way Hasidim would, would phrase it. You can't go to sleep like an animal and expect them to wake up anything else. The way you put yourself to sleep, that's the way you're going to wake up in the morning. And Hasidus and Hasidim spent a lot of time focusing on the way a Jew goes to bed. How do you go to bed at night? What's your last things you do in preparation before you go to bed? Because that's important for the first things you can do when you wake up. So there's an idea, there's an idea that, that um, you know, in, in America, in America and in, in, any world, in any part of the world, I guess, that has television. So people turn on the television or they turn on a movie and they go to sleep uh, watching to, with the TV on or the movie playing in the background. So what's the final words? What's the final things I'm hearing before I go to bed? How am I going to bed? I'm listening to somebody else, to some other person out there filling my head with some nonsense. Whatever it is, it's nonsense. It's those. It's folly. It's emptiness. It's really emptiness. If it wasn't emptiness, I probably wouldn't be able to fall asleep so easily while they're, while they're talking, most likely. So Chassidim would try to, before they go to bed, right before they went to bed, they would try to study a quick, not, not for a long time, maybe 30 seconds even. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about the matter of time, but it was an idea. Get one idea in your head of purpose. Get one meaningful idea in your brain before you go to sleep. Nowadays, they have little books with short little stories. Or with little anecdotes. So people have their night table, they pull it out, they read it, and they go to bed like that. But there's an idea. It's not a Hasidic idea. It's a mitzvah from the Torah. The mitzvah from the Torah is to say Shema two times a day, in the morning and in the evening. We have a mitzvah to say Shema when you wake up in the morning. The mitzvah to say Shema in the evening. When do you fulfill the mitzvah of Shema in the evening? So if you daven the evening prayer, so then you fulfill the Shema on that. But even if you said the Shema on the evening davening, there's something what's called Kriya Shema Shalamita, saying Shema by the bed. Shema before you go to bed. It's found in the Siddur. If you open up the Siddur, the blue Siddur, if you have the blue Siddur here. You want to know, just to give you a reference, what I'm talking about. It's found in the Siddur on page 141. 141. It's called the prayer before retiring at night. Kriya Shema Hamita. Page 141. And to be honest with you, it's got, uh, you know, and this, it's uh, seven, eight pages. 141 to six pages over here. Um, it's six pages long. But I don't want to focus on the six pages, but I want to just focus on one paragraph. That's the first paragraph that we say. People don't realize this, but I think it's a very powerful paragraph before you go to sleep. And it's genius. It's really genius because it helps you go to bed the right way. It helps you wake up the right way. And this is basically a paragraph of forgiveness. Before I go to bed, I forgive anyone that may have hurt me today. You just let it go. Let it go. Let's read. I'll read a few in English. Page 140, if you don't have it. Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who has angered or vexed me or sinned against me, either physically or financially, against my honor or anything else that is mine, whether accidentally or intentionally, inadvertently or deliberately, by speech or by deed, in this incarnation or in any other, any Israelite, may no man be punished on my account. Let's just stop there, halfway through. What a beautiful thing to say before you go to bed. We acknowledge that it's possible that someone may have offended us today. Someone may have disturbed us today. Someone may have put up resistance to something that we needed to do today. And it bothered us. It disturbed us. But what are we saying before we go to bed? We're not taking it with us to sleep. Why is it so important not to take it with me to sleep? Because if you take it with you to sleep, you're going to wake up with it. You're going to wake up with it. You're not going to be able to enter into the day like Avram. You're not going to be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished today to have that meaningful day. So we let it go. And we ask God, not only are we letting it go, but don't do anything to that person. They shouldn't be harmed on my account. May it be your will, Lord, my God and God of my fathers, that I shall sin no more nor repeat my sins, neither shall I again anger you, nor do what is wrong in your eyes. The sins that I have committed erase in your abounding mercies, but not through suffering or severe illness. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Then we can move on to asking God for forgiveness. We've forgiven everyone. Now we ask God for forgiveness. 
And we go to bed now with a clear conscience. We go to bed with a clear mind. And then we turn and we say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echod. And we say the Shema and we retire for the evening. What a beautiful idea. What a beautiful prayer this is. Because as Hasidim would say, the way you go to sleep is the way you're going to wake up. If you want to wake up, if you want to have a good day, go to sleep the right way. How do you go to sleep the right way? I think this is a great place to start. By saying this paragraph and the Shema is a great place to start because it allows us to clear ourselves of any toxicities that we've accumulated throughout the day and not to carry it over into the next. There's no rollover. No rollover. We don't want any rollover. And I'll conclude with the story. I'm not sure if the story happened or if it didn't happen, but Siddham would say the story. Back in the olden days, you know, today it's hard for people to imagine this, but back in the olden days, Jews were very, very poor. And because they were very poor, Jews simply didn't have, couldn't afford schooling for the children. They were peasants and they were very ignorant. They simply did not know how to read or to write. They never had the ability to receive such type of education. All they knew was when they were seven years old, they started helping. When they were eight years old, it became part-time. By the time they were nine, ten, it was full-time, milking the cow, schlepping the water, chopping the wood to put together two pennies to be able to put a piece of bread on the table and pay the rent. Many, many, many Jews lived like this, unfortunately. So in the city, what they would do is they would get together and they would have a, 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 you know, a collection. They would put some money together and they would hire someone in the town that they would be, the rabbi and the leader. And he didn't have to be so smart. All he had to do was not to read. And he would be able to be the teacher. He would give them some on Shabbos. He would give them a short word. He would inspire them for the holidays. If they needed any help Jewishly, he would be there to assist them. So what happened was one day, one of these peasants received mail. He got a letter in the mail. He opened it up and he doesn't know how to read. He can't read what it says. So he walks over to the home of the learned man. He knocks on his door and he says, I got a letter in the mail. Can you please read the letter? Excuse me. He says, sure. My pleasure. He takes it out of the envelope and he starts reading and it says, Dear Chaim Yankel, I hope this letter finds you good, but I'm sorry to inform you that your father, Baruch, died last week, Tuesday, and he was buried last week, Wednesday. And the guy is continuing to read, and the person faints on the spot. The peasant, the Jewish peasant, faints on the spot. From the news, a shock. His father died. He fainted. They revive him. They help him out. They get him back on his two feet. He sits shiva. And the, the community tries to support him in the best way that they could. During the shiva, so the learned man came to pay a shiva visit, obviously, and the community members paid a shiva visit. So someone, they were telling over what happened, that he read the letter and Chaim Yankel died. So someone in the community turns to him and says, I don't understand. You, he doesn't know how to read. He's only listening to what you have to say. You're the one that's smart and is capable of reading. How could it be that you read the letter and you didn't faint? But he read the letter and he did faint. I mean, but he heard you read the letter and he did faint. And of course, the answer is very simple. He said, because it's his father. It's not my father, it's his father. So it meant something to him. That's why he fainted. And Hasidim would use this story to stress the idea that it has to mean something to us. Life can't be about somebody else's father. I don't wake up living somebody else's life, what somebody else wants me to do, how somebody else wants me to be. That's not a life of boim bayam. That's not a life of coming into my days. That's a life of folly, of silly. A Jew has to take every day of life, if it's mine, it's relatable to me, its effect is on me. It's my personal life, it's my father that we're talking about over here. 
It's my relationships that we're talking about over here. It's my skill that we're talking about over here. And this way, we're able to actually have a meaningful day, day in and day out, which leads us to have meaningful weeks, meaningful months, meaningful years. And then when we reach the ripe old age, what the Torah calls old age, when we reach those years, like Avram, in our 90s, in our 100s, we can look back and say, ah, I know that boy and by young. I know that I took life seriously. Life was meaningful. Now someone may come along and say, I, what happened up until now? I wasted so many years of my life. Many years I didn't, I wasn't accomplishing, I wasn't doing. I only learned about this now. Now we're in 2023. What am I supposed to do about all the years and up until now? It's a good question. And the answer is, if you learned about it now, it means that you could start now and you can make up for missed time by helping somebody else. That's how we make up for lost time. When we help other people out, that makes us have double our efforts. That makes us have double our accomplishments. And double is triple. The ripple effect we'll never know. So what we'll conclude with this idea, take from Avram and Sarah this message, how to live Full life. How do you live a full life? By living every day to its fullest. By treating every day as if it belongs to me. This day is mine. I enter into the day. I have control over the day. No one's going to distract me. Even if I do have resistance, I know it's part of the it's part of the mission that I have today is to overcome this resistance. And as I said, a beautiful way to have that attitude when we wake up is when we go to bed. To go to bed the right way. To read this prayer before the Shema to get rid of any negativity that we may have accumulated over the day. And hopefully this way, we will all merit Avram and a God blessed Avram with everything, Bakoil is with everything. Bakoil, Rashi says, quotes from the Medrash, that Bakoil means he had a son. And in his old age, God blessed him with a son. And of course, for us, what this means, that we are able to see the fruits of our labor. You work hard and you want to see results. And the results of our labor accumulatively is going to be when our results produce the ultimate reward that coming of Mashiach may be the of Yameinu. Amen. Any questions for today's class?